where I work mainly on medieval sex and my new book The Fires of Lust, Sex in the Middle Ages is out now. Um, my talk today is all about sex in the Middle Ages and about the ideas, medical and religious, that influence people and their ideas and behaviour, about the sex lives of ordinary people, about the many ways you would get sex wrong in the Middle Ages and also about some of the more entertaining stuff like the um, culture, the smutty stories in things like the Canterbury Tales and the um, rather bizarre images in medieval arts. Yeah, so it's lovely to be here today and uh, yes I'm afraid that this is all in a way a, a plug for my book um, out now with reaction very interesting I think please buy it um, I won't mention it again probably um, but when I started writing a book about sex in the middle ages and I started telling people that I was writing on this subject I quite quickly discovered I think three main preconceptions on the subject um, the first came from people who'd watched too much Game of Thrones and thought that it was all sort of very violent very incestuous all very backwards very unpleasant um, then there were people who'd read a lot of Mills and Boone and thought that it was all sort of swooning ladies and forceful knights. Um, and then there was people who'd watched too much Carry On and thought that it was all sort of, they were all under the thumb of the church, sexually repressed, um, but also sex mad. So what I suppose I've been spent the past few years trying to do is to um, demolish some of those myths and, and present the more complicated reality. Um, I think what all of those ideas have got in common is that they see medieval sex and sexuality as something that's very different from its modern equivalent. But at the same time, people are convinced, well, bodies haven't changed, what you can do with them hasn't changed that much. So things must have been exactly the same. Um, and in reality, I think there's truth in both of those things. You know, um, there have been significant changes in how sex is regarded, how it's thought about, and therefore in how it's understood and experienced. So for one thing, medieval, the medieval mind tended to see sex as something that one person did to another, um, rather than an activity in which both people were as actively engaged, or equally engaged anyway. So there was a very strong, strong tendency to see sex in terms of active, implicitly male roles, and passive, implicitly female roles, to the extent that even when they're talking about same-sex acts, they will try and work out well, who was the active one and who was the passive one. And the picture's complicated for us by the fact that certainly the significance of certain acts has changed. So one I often talk about here is kissing somebody on the lips, which for us, I think, does tend to be sexual. But in the Middle Ages, of course, could also be about affection or respect, or in the case of Henry II and Beckett, political bonds. I think it's also important to recognise that language has changed. So some of the terms that we now use, things like heterosexuality and homosexuality, that really sort of frame our understanding of sexuality are very much 19th century inventions and therefore in some ways anachronistic when we're talking about medieval sex. And so some historians have suggested that we should think about medieval sex in terms of acts rather than identities or to think in terms of different categories. So maybe natural versus unnatural or illicit versus illicit or virginity versus just about everything else. So those are some of the things that I'd like to bear in mind while we're talking about sex in the Middle Ages. And I think it's also really important to remember that, of course, I'm going to generalise because I've only got 50 minutes. But just as we don't all think the same, we don't all do the same. The same is true of medieval people. And I'm talking about a wide geographical area and a wide time frame, and there were variations. But on the other hand, individual attitudes and experiences are shaped by the world in which we live by legal constraints, by medical ideas, and in many societies, including, of course, medieval Europe, religious beliefs. And so I want to start today by talking about some of these ideas that shaped the sex lives of medieval people. This is a, a little set, set of wall paintings from one of my favourite churches down in um, West Sussex, and it's the story of Adam and Eve. Um, and that familiar story is really important because it was at the heart of medieval understandings of sex. Before the fall, Adam and Eve were humans as they were supposed to be. They were immortal, they were free from sin, and they had perfect bodies. Medieval theologians spent a frankly excessive amount of time debating what sex in the Garden of Eden would have been like. Um, and what they all agreed on was that it would have been free from sin and something that only happened for good reasons, i.e. reproduction, rather than bad ones i.e. lust. And so it's only after the fall, they think, that sex becomes a disruptive force, a source of shame, and everyone who's conceived through sex is tainted by original sin, 
which is what makes sex potentially a source of fear for medieval people, because as one 12th century English sermon put it, bodily pleasure is for a better for a moment, but the hellfire which follows thereon will endure forever. And the surest way to avoid hellfire was, according to the medieval church, to emulate the saints and to remain a virgin, which of course was really difficult for a mere mortal to, um, to do, not least because being a true virgin in this context meant not just avoiding sex, but also masturbation, impure thoughts, anything vaguely sexual at all. On the other hand, because they saw virginity largely as a mental state, it did mean that it could in theory be regained which was quite a source of comfort to a lot of devout wives, Marjorie Kent being a particularly famous example of somebody who was supposedly told in a vision by Christ that it was okay, despite the fact she'd been married for years and had 15 children, she would dance with the virgins in heaven. Um, but we shouldn't get too carried away by the idea that the medieval church was completely opposed to sex. Um, most medieval people, of course, did marry, and by the later Middle Ages, the church was generally prepared to admit that this was a good thing. It saved the souls of those who otherwise would have committed much worse sins, and it produced Christian offspring. And actually, despite all its high ideals, the medieval church was very keen on um, forgiveness for those who are generally contrite. And I think the popularity of Mary Magdalene, who was believed to be a repentant prostitute, it, it actually demonstrates the power of this ideal. And then, of course, another really important influence on medieval, medieval ideas about sex was medieval theory, medical theory. And although their ideas are very different to ours, it's based on an equally sophisticated set of ideas. Um, it's all based on the idea of the four humours and that those four humours need to be kept in balance or you'll become ill. And so within this sex system, sex is a form of excretion and it's a good thing as long as it's in moderation. Um, so it's much discussed in guides to healthy living like this one. Um, but there were dangers. Men in particular who had, had too much sex were thought to lose too much heat, too much moisture from their bodies, and that could make you really ill or even kill you. So you have to be careful. Um, women were less at risk of this because sex, they were naturally cold and sex warmed up their bodies. So generally speaking, that was a good thing. But because both sexes were thought to release seed during intercourse, abstinence was dangerous for everybody. It was in that the superfluities built up in your body and again, it was possible, according to medieval medical thinking, to die of celibacy. So be careful. Um, balance really is the, is the key medieval health concern in terms of sex. But they did know about sexually transmitted diseases. This poor chap certainly does. Um, and they were particularly worried about leprosy, which they thought could be sexually transmitted. In the early 14th century, a man called Arno de Verniol described how, as a student in Toulouse, he'd been to visit a prostitute. And the next day, his face swelled up and he was terrified. He thought he'd got leprosy and he swore he'd never have sex with a woman again. Um, and those sorts of cases, I think we often assume are just proof of medieval superstition that Arno thought he'd done something bad and God was punishing him. But actually, medieval medical texts include detailed descriptions of how a leper's semen could remain in a woman's uterus after sex, turning into putrid vapors, which would then enter the um, pores on the penis of her next partner. And that's how you end up like that. So it's all very rational. Um, as were concerns actually about sex and the plague, often during epidemics, there's a lot of talk about um, how you should abstain from sex. And obviously that's not a good time to um, anger God when you might die at any minute. But again, they're worried about sex as something that warms the body, opens the pores, and then bad vapors can come into the body and make you ill. So it's a practical health measure as well as a, something to do with sin. These texts also, if you've got this sort of disease, they've got lots of helpful cures. Um, yeah, things like some of them are relatively innocuous, things like washing the penis with vinegar, um, others less so, anointing it with quicklime and then sort of shaving bits off. I mean, if you think about that, maybe virginity is not such a bad idea after all. The third principle governing medieval sex was the idea that the authorities, both secular and ecclesiastical, needed to control people's sexual behavior both because it was important to try and make individual sinners repent so that they would be saved, but also because it was widely bad, believed that one bad apple could contaminate the whole community um, and failure to punish sexual sin could anger God and lead to divine punishment and also cause all sorts of social disorder because, you know, adultery and things in a small community lead, lead to all sorts of arguments and you, 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 in the interest of social order, that's something that needs to be controlled. And so, as we'll see, there were 
lots of rules governing the sexual lives of medieval people and potentially serious consequences for individuals who broke those rules. So that's the theory. What about real life? Well, obviously in the Middle Ages as today, if you wanted to have sex, the first thing you needed to do was find a partner. And that could be a challenging process, not least because there were lots of rules about who you were allowed to be with. And as Emma's already mentioned, there were lots of rules about in terms of relationship, but it's a given in this context that your partner needs to be of the opposite sex from a medieval perspective. But it's also very important that you're not related. Um, and medieval conceptions of incest are really broad. Um, you couldn't marry anybody within a certain number of degrees of kinship, and that includes third cousins. So it's really quite distant. But also the relatives of anybody you've ever had sex with, their elves, and also any of your spiritual kin. So your godparents, your godchildren, their families. You wonder how that worked in practical terms in small rural communities. Um, as it's clear that sort of very close incest, um, the sort that we would still disapprove of, um, very much was forbidden. But there was some wriggle room in the outer limits and something that you could seek a, a dispensation from. Age mattered. Um, the canon law required that a girl be at least 12 and a boy 14 to marry. And contrary to popular belief, child marriages were very rare. They did happen at the very elite levels of society. But in Northern Europe, certainly most people married in their early to mid 20s. Obviously, dynastic marriages were the exception to that rule. And to take a very local case, Catherine of Aragon and Prince Arthur, who arrived here in Arthur's new uh, arrived here in Ludlow, sorry, as newlyweds in 1502. But even in these sorts of cases, uh, you know, it wasn't always seen as a good idea. And obviously, in this case, it became a very big question whether they did or not. But consummation was seen as a bit of a risky business for teenagers because although it was acknowledged that teenagers were naturally lustful and might be keen to have sex. Doctors were very aware that young girls were particularly likely to desire childbirth, and they were also worried that young parents were more likely to produce um, unhealthy offspring. And, and so medical authorities certainly counsel abstinence until the late teens or early 20s. Whether or not it was relevant in that case, of course, would become a matter of um, international dispute, which we won't go into today, but th there are reasons not to, shall we say. Couples were supposed to be compatible in all sorts of other ways, too, in terms of being the same religion, the same social status, roughly the same age, and consent was very important. I think there, you know, there is this strong sense, even lower down the social scale, that you want your family to consent to your marriage, you want them to approve, even if you are hoping to marry for love, which was a bigger factor, I think, than we tend to assume. So, what did medieval people find attractive? The Ideal medieval woman seems to have been Bathsheba. Um, blonde haired, pale skinned, slim with fine features, small pert breasts. They don't like big breasts, they associate them with promiscuity. Um, men were, I think the male ideas about sort of ideas about male beauty have changed less. It, it, they talk a lot in texts about men being tall and strong and well proportioned. Um, body hair is seen as an important symbol of masculinity. And it was widely assumed, at least by male writers, that women like men with their penises. Um, although people weren't supposed to have sex before marriage, inevitably some did. Um, and I think probably particularly at the lower end of society, as long as a couple were engaged, and as long as they got married before any children turned up, um, it wouldn't cause too many problems. But premarital sex was risky. It could be punished as fornication, um, and it could damage your reputation. Um, and again, I'm not going to talk about the sort of the marriage making process because Emma's already done that, but you can see how that would cause difficulties that, um, you know, that you do get couples who exchange vows, have sex, and a few months or years later end up in court with one person suing the other for breach of promise, or a woman going at least making give me child support. Um, so yeah, it's a fraught business. But there are risks also associated with deciding not to have sex before marriage, not least that somebody might use love magic on you. They're very worried about this, um, partly because it goes against their ideas about the importance of consent and that by using love magic, you're forcing somebody to have sex with you who doesn't necessarily want to. Um, and so there's a lot of concern about food and drink based trickery, which tends to be associated with women and things like putting their menstrual blood in drinks or kneading bread on their buttocks. I don't quite know how that's supposed to work, but it's one that comes up surprisingly often. Um, 
and then educated men get associated with sort of more sinister things like making images and summoning demons and transporting people to magic circles so they can have their way with them. Um, but yeah, but both of those obviously are seen as a sin, but also as something that's disturbing in terms of consent. Another risk is lovesickness, which was seen as a genuine medical condition, although it does have quite the tendency to afflict wealthy young men who can't get their own way and then have to do things like go on holiday to cure themselves and cheer themselves up. Um, so, yeah, maybe that's not such a bad one to have. So courtship could definitely be a challenging process for men and women alike. But what happens once you settle down with your ideal partner or at least a partner? Well, the, the church acknowledged that sex was a really important part of marriage, and partly, of course, because one of its purposes, one of its main justifications, is that it will produce offspring. Um, but many people thought that a marriage was only a truly a marriage once it had been consummated. There's a lot of debate about that, whether it's consent or consummation that makes a marriage. And ultimately, the church tends to decide consent because they were very worried about the fact that Mary and Joseph had never consummated their marriage. And you couldn't argue that that wasn't the proper marriage, could you? So, so they tend to focus more and more on the consent. But at the same time, they teach that married couples owe each other the marital debt. Basically, they've got a religious obligation to have sex with each other on demand. And by the 12th century, this was taken so seriously that there were actually only a handful of circumstances in which a person could legitimately refuse sex with a spouse. Um, madness is one. Um, if you're very near to childbirth and you're worried it might cause a stillbirth is another one. Um, but rules on which the early and medieval church had taken a very hard line, like no sex during Lent or no sex in church, is one they discuss an awful lot. Um, they, the church increasingly argues, well, if that's the only option, and if you don't let your husband have sex with you on Good Friday, he'll go off and commit adultery. The lesser sin is to let him have his own way. Um, and I think, I mean, this does obviously cause all sorts of problems. It's not supposed to mean that couples are having unlimited sex all the time. In fact, I think the aim is to turn it into a duty rather than a pleasure. And they actually talk about if you're taking too much pleasure in your wife, if you'd want to have sex with her, even if you weren't married to her, that's a sin. Um, and of course, for women, one of the particularly serious implications is that there's no such thing as marital rape. Um, so it's, yeah, not all fun and games. Um, despite the importance of the, of the marital debt, there is such a thing as chaste marriage, a union in which the couple mutually agreed to give up sex for religious reasons. And while some couples chose to have sex, chose not to have sex, others got married only to find that they couldn't have sex. And in this, this is one of the cases in which you could seek an annulment. Um, typically only because of male impotence, the assumption seems to have been that a woman, there weren't women who couldn't physically have sex and the best way to deal with a frigid woman was to force her. Um, but you do get occasionally cases of women um, petitioning for annulment there's a particularly good set from the Archdiocese of York in the later Middle Ages. Um, it's, it's six cases in, in the whole of the Archdiocese of York in the 14th and 15th centuries, so it's very, very rare, but it is possible. And one of the reasons it is so rare is because the level of proof required is so high. They're quite worried about unhappy couples colluding um, and sort of faking their way through an annulment. So it's a long process. It usually takes years, and it does involve these very intimate physical examinations. Um, in which the man's ability to perform will be tested and women will be examined to see if they're virgins. Um, in one case in York in the early 1430s, a man named William Barton was examined by 13 people, um, women who compare his genitals favorably to those of their husbands and men who compare it to his own, uh, to their own. Um, and his wife was also examined. Um, a group of, of women examined her breasts who judged they were not those of a virgin. She wouldn't let them look at her genitals, which was deemed suspicious. And they suspected that actually she was probably pregnant. Um, I mean, th they sound quite amusing in the abstract, these cases, but I think in practice, that sort of level of scrutiny, especially when you think this is often carried out by your neighbours, um, must have been deeply humiliating. And in this particular case, the husband was considered to have proved his potency and they were required to stay together. But you do wonder about the state of the marriage after that. Now, one obviously really important factor in a lot of relationships is whether or not to have children, which is what I'm going to move on to next. Um, and if a couple wanted to have children, a medieval couple, medical authorities had a lot of advice for them. Um, a surprising amount of which concerns sexual pleasure. 
because the dominant medical theory about conception suggested that it could only happen if both man and woman had produced seed and therefore had an orgasm. And so medical texts included a surprising amount about foreplay, about sexual positions, and about what to do afterwards. Keep still. Um, there are also lots of tips on how to conceive a male or female. It involves which side you lay on after sex and when not to have sex at all. There was one cautionary tale about a woman who'd had sex during a storm and gave birth to a toad. So that's definitely best avoided. There's also a lot in medical texts about infertility. And despite what the story of Henry VIII and his wives would seem to suggest, it was widely accepted that the fault could lie with either the woman or the man, or with the incompatibility of the two. And so there were urine-based tests that were supposed to show whether or not an individual was fertile, and various possible explanations, ranging from physical defects of the genitals to humoral imbalances, to divine displeasure, spells. Um, couples who struggled to conceive had a whole range of options. They could try medical treatments, they could try spiritual treatments. When the shrine of um, Thomas Cantaloupe in Hereford was inventoried in the early 14th centuries, the offerings included nearly 100 nightgowns from women who'd gone to his shrine, prayed for a child, uh, and later had one. And there's a particularly insightful set of correspondence from a mercantile couple, Margarita and Francesco Dantini from Prato in Italy, um, who tried for years and never, never managed to have children. But there's lots of suggestions from their family and friends that she should go to a particular doctor who'd cured other women with similarly painful periods, or they should go to a different city, or she should try a particular smelly poultice, or feed more beggars, or wear a special belt. There's all sorts of, of things that people suggest. They remain childless, but they were lucky in the sense that I suppose they had supportive friends and family, whereas court records include all sorts of cases of women who were desperate to conceive and fell victim to forces who sold them extortionately expensive amulets or bedsheets that were supposed to work magic and then disappeared with their money. And of course, while med some medieval people were desperately trying to conceive, others were trying to prevent pregnancy. So what methods were available to medieval people who didn't want children? A lot of the methods are to do with avoiding this mixing of seeds that they think is crucial to conception. So there's a lot about coitus interruptus, um, putting oil on the genitals, jumping up and down or sneezing after sex, that comes up a lot. Um, and there is some evidence to suggest that these sorts of things were more common than we might think. William of Pagula, writing in Yorkshire in the 1320s, claimed that coitus interruptus was widely practiced to the extent that many people these days don't consider it a sin. Then there are various other um, humoral options. So you do things like eat rhubarb to suppress lust or put mint on your genitals or wear an amulet made from the testicles of um, a male weasel around your neck. They're all based on humoral theory. So there, there is a logic behind them. They're not quite as random as they sound. But whether they would work or not, uh, is probably another question. Um, abortion, obviously, is even harder to trace, partly because it was widely viewed as murder and therefore is best concealed. So we don't really know how common it was. But I think I've, I've read enough cases in which women take portions or potions or drunk hard liquor or punched in the stomach to know that certainly it was something that people did try and do. Um, and so even if the efficacy of the methods available was far from guaranteed, people did know about it and tried to do it. So, so far I've very much focused on a normal medieval life cycle, courtship, marriage, children. But of course, not everybody in the Middle Ages followed that pattern, not everybody wanted to. Um, and one big group who didn't or weren't supposed to were the clergy, who from the um, late 11th century onwards were all supposed to be celibate, which obviously some a lot of them struggled with. Some of them received miraculous interventions. There's a good story about a German nun who was planning to go out with her would-be lover. Um, she was saved when an image of the Virgin Mary slapped her in the face, knocking her out cold. And by the time she woke up in the morning, it was too late to go out. Um, others, like this chap, castrated themselves, although the church disapproves of that. And there, there are records in the papal, rec papal registers of, of clerics who do castrate themselves and then have to be given dispensations to be allowed to continue as a priest. Um, others just sort of tried to avoid temptation there's a lot of stories about holy men and women who wouldn't even look at members of the opposite sex even their own relatives and they do things that are supposed to reduce their susceptibility to lust so there's lots of stories about medieval holy men who immerse themselves in rivers um, particularly in the winter when it's very cold um, who live on very restricted diets um, who wear hair shirts who do things like chuck themselves into brambles 
um, all, all sorts of, of, of daft things they get up to, to to try and help them with this lifestyle. Of course, not all of them succeeded, not, not all of them tried. Um, and so, so oh, it's very hard to get a handle on sort of the exact rates. But there's a um, set of visitation records from Hereford, the Hereford Diocese in 1397, which suggests that 14% of clerics were found guilty of a sexual misdemeanor, or accused of a, a sexual misdemeanor on that visitation. So it definitely is a problem. Um, there are some variations across Europe. Iberia seems to be more hung up on interfaith relationships and less worried about clerical celibacy. Um, so that some some clerics there do have long term concubines. Elsewhere, you get massive scandals. So when the Bishop of Lincoln went to conduct a visitation at Dorchester Abbey near Oxford in 1441, he uncovered stories including the abbot supposedly had five mistresses who he was supporting with the goods of the house. Um, another brother had been caught with the woman in the bell tower, and when they were found, hit her in a chest. Um, it was another chap who was often having play, play in chess with women in his private chamber. Another had two married mistresses and had to, had to pay off one of the husbands to stop him killing him, and that was all just in one, one abbey. Now, obviously, that's an ex exceptionally bad case, but there were, shall we say, quite a range of approaches to the challenge of clerical celibacy. And the clerics weren't the only people who were um, sort of had their sex lives subject to scrutiny. It was all sorts of ways in which you could end up in court because you've been accused of some sort of sexual immorality, whether that's fornication or adultery or incest or bestiality. Um, under some legal systems and capital crimes, in reality, very few people get executed for these sorts of offences. They tend to go in more for um, corporal punishment, things like flogging or branding, um, lots of fines increasingly towards the end of the Middle Ages, or some people are subject to some sort of form of public humiliation. This is running, which became quite popular for a while in France and Spain in the late 14th, late 13th and early 14th century, where adulterers were tied together at the level of the genitals in the nude and paraded through the streets like that. Um, now that's supposed to act as a deterrent, you'd hope that it did, um, but also to serve as a warning to others. Um, but for the most part, it wasn't supposed to ostracize people from their communities. Certainly in the case of adultery and particularly in the later Middle Ages, they wanted to punish the offence, but in a way that no marriages were irreparably damaged. Um, so in most places, adultery definitely wasn't an excuse for murdering your wife or confining her to a convent or any of the other things that tend to happen in medieval films about the Middle Ages. There are even some people who argue that male adultery was a greater sin than the female equivalent because men were supposed to sort of have more self-control, know better, and to set an example. Um, the French theologian Jacques de Vitry even wrote that much female adultery resulted from sadness and desperation provoked by male drunkenness and violence, which isn't to say that they were condoning adultery, obviously, but there were a far wider range of attitudes to these things than we might expect. Um, and yeah, I mean, despite that, that sort of open-mindedness, there were so, so many ways to get it wrong. Um, one of the most serious sexual offences in the Middle Ages, if I lost, oh dear, I've killed it altogether. Now I've gone to, have I gone too far? No, no, that's right, that's not where I wanted to be. Um, where was I? Sodomy, sodomy. So sodomy is an all-encompassing term that basically is any sort of non-normative, non-reproductive sex. So not just what we probably now think of sodomy, male-male sex, but also sex in, uh, between anyone in the wrong position or using the wrong orifice or with someone of the same sex or masturbation, basic, basically anything other than a man and woman having sex in the middle, missionary position, preferably for the purposes of reproduction. Now, I think we might reasonably ask, well, how far did medieval people obey the church's warnings about, about sexual experimentation? And obviously it's very hard to find out what went on in ordinary medieval bedrooms. But it is clear that people did know about the sort of sex that very much wasn't sanctioned by the church. There are, for example, a lot of jokey stories about inexperienced men who have sex with a woman who um, goes on top and later the man is convinced that he's pregnant because he's so stupid. Um, there do some, seem to have been some things that were sort of quite widely considered repugnant and not just by the church. I've come across several references to marriages which ended because the wife refused to have um, anal sex with her husband, for example. And there are very, very few references to oral sex to the extent that I think it must have been very rarely practiced. Um, th there's also cases in which um, 
cases of gay sex in which there's one in particular that sticks in my mind where a man says he, ad he admits to having had sex with this man, but it says they had interfemoral intercourse, not anal sex, because according to him, it's a lesser sin. So people are thinking in terms of that hierarchy of sin, or at least some of them are. Which brings me quite neatly to the question of same-sex attraction. Um, oh, that's a masturbating angel to go with sodomy, as you were. Um, uh, moving on, swiftly onwards. Um, so, yeah, men who had sex with men. And, I mean, obviously, attitudes are pretty consistent throughout the Middle Ages. Um, it's pretty consistent if it is a sin. But the intensity and impact of that hostility in, varies quite considerably over time and from region. Late medieval Florence is a particularly interesting case. The city developed in the 15th century such a reputation for this crime that in Germany they called men who had sex with other men Florences. Um, how hard that reputation, how uh, whether that reputation was deserved is hard to know. Um, the Florentine authorities definitely thought there was a problem because in the early 15th century they set up an institution called the Office of the Knight purely to deal with men who had sex with other men. Um, and the institutions of that, the records of that institution are really interesting because they tell us a lot about prosecution and punishment, which tended to be in terms of fines, and there are lots of repeat offenders. Only really problematic cases do they do they banish or execute. Um, but there's also a lot about some real men and their relationships. And there's a lot of casual sex. There are certainly places in Florence that in the 15th century you go to if you want to pick up a man. Um, but there's also some, some long-term relationships. There's, a, there's one couple in particular who are accused in 1497 who've been together for several years and have sworn some sort of oath on the Gospels to remain faithful to each other, some sort of marriage-type bond. So it, it's quite a, a big and complicated picture. That's men. What about women who had sex with women? Well, they're even harder to trace from the whole of the Middle Ages that we know of. I think it's fewer than two dozen cases of women who are explicitly accused of having sex with other women, all of whom were punished, mostly by execution for their behaviour. Um, and in the cases we do know about, there was this really strong tendency to, to as I said at the beginning, to, to try and fit these cases into passive and active roles and to see that the one who's committed the male role has committed the more serious offence. And so there's a 1405 letter of pardon from a French royal register dealing with a sexual relationship between two married women called Jeanne and Laurence. And they were both prosecuted, they were both imprisoned, but Laurence appealed. She said the other woman had initiated the relationship, had acted like a man, had attacked her with a knife when she tried to end the relationship, and by presenting herself as the woman in this relationship, Laurence got her sentence reduced. Now, I think it is possible that this sort of um, assumption that it's only in those sort of cases where there's somebody very explicitly taking the male role seems to have attracted the interests of the courts does mean that maybe some female couples were able to go unnoticed, at least by the relevant authorities. So we might ask what other sorts of sources we might look at for same-sex relations other than the court records. And at one particularly interesting source, I think, is twin markers. This one's in Istanbul, and it shows two knights, William Neville and Sir John Clanvo. Um, they both died in October 1391 in Istanbul. And a chronicle tells us that Clanvo, who, who incidentally was from a local marcher family, was devastated by Neville's death, refused to eat, and died two days later. And this is a little brass from a, a little church on the Kent Sussex border of two, two women. Um, Elizabeth Etchingham and Agnes Oxenbridge. And Agnes died nearly 30 years after Elizabeth. And it, for some reason, is buried with the Etchinghams in their parish church and depicted on this brass with the other woman. And both of these memorials depict these couples in the ways that, sort of, in terms of imagery, we'd expect of, of couples. Are they firm evidence for same sex relationships? Obviously not. You know, we could be looking at brother brotherhood, we could be looking at close friendship between a pair of committed spinsters. But I think, and certainly some historians have argued, that it's a possibility that we should be considering if we're going to try and understand the ways in which medieval people could defy sexual norms. One other way to do that was through um, relationships involving different races and different religions. There's a lot of racial stereotyping in terms of sex goes on in the Middle Ages. Um, othering people by accusing them of deviant sexual practices or having unusual physical characteristics. Um, 
Gerald Wales is a particularly good source for this sort of thing. He, he's stereotyping of the Irish as a filthy people wallowing in vice, and particularly fond of incest, and also actually of the Welsh, despite his close personal ties with the, with the country. He, he yeah, claims that they lost first Troy and then Britain because of their fondness for sodomy. He admits they've given that up, but they're still sunk in sin. He says they're frequently guilty of rape and adultery, still practice incest, often marry within the family degree, within the forbidden degrees, and attend to take young girls from their families just to live with them, not to marry them. Um, and that sort of stereotyping gets even wilder in the case of non-white and non-European people. So there's a lot of stereotyping of Muslims and black people as being extremely lustful, particularly in close crusading literature. There, I don't think there are any sexual sins that Muslims don't get accused of. But interestingly, Muslim sources do the same back to Christians. What, what, what? According to, um, so yeah, from Muslim sources from the Middle East of this period, what the French aren't getting up to isn't worth doing. Um, and Mandeville's travels and, and sources like that very much eroticize the exotic um, and claim these distant lands are full of wife swapping and naked bathing and hermaphrodites and all sorts. But even if we just think about Western Europe, I think it's worth remembering that the Christian norms I've mostly been talking about coexisted with lots of other approaches. And so you know, there's a sizable Jewish population, particularly in Iberia, only in England up to the 1290s. Um, but they have their own ideas about sexuality. They're far less hung up on virginity and celibacy than the And in some respects, they're far more open-minded. For example, they think that, they, that some rabbis in Iberia actually recommend the use of contraceptive sponges to breastfeeding women because they think that the they think the sex curdles the milk. Um, that, that's a medical theory that the sex the sex the sex curdles the milk of a breastfeeding woman and will kill kill the child she's nursing. So it's better from from this perspective to, to use contraception than to kill your child. Um, particularly in Iberia, there are lots of interplay relationships, although the authorities have got lots of views about that. Heretics get accused of all sorts of sexual deviancy. There were, of course, women who were accused of having sex with demons, which at the very, particularly at the very end of the period, starts to sort of morph into the, the witch craze of the um, early modern period. And there's more about all of those sorts of things in the book. Um, I think I'm running out of time. I, I can't actually see the clock. But, uh, okay. Very okay at the moment. Charlie could. Um, so, so, yeah, another form of deviancy is, is, is prostitution. Um, and again, attitudes to this are, are quite complicated. Um, obviously, it's viewed as a sin, um, and the church is very keen on trying to reform prostitutes and setting up sort of convent-like institutions for them to go into where they can be reformed. But more broadly speaking, society is wrestling with a question that we, we're still wrestling with today. Is it better to try and ban this or to accept that it will happen and to try to regulate it? And up until the 13th century, the emphasis was very firmly on expulsion of, of sex workers from cities. After that, towns and cities across Europe start to establish civic brothels um, or recognised red light districts where women were allowed to work and up to a point protected from violent clients, exploitative pimps, all that sort of thing. They tried to regulate who could go to a brothel. So uh, young unmarried men, that was OK. Husbands and definitely not the clergy weren't supposed to, although obviously some of them did get caught there. And in fact, the cities with large numbers of clerics um, often became centres of prostitution. There were certainly women in late medieval York who seemed to have catered to a specifically clerical clientele. Um, and inevitably, a lot of went on. A lot of went, what a lot of what went on in these sorts of institutions was pretty grim. Um, you know, the, the, as I've looked at cases of women being trafficked, violently attacked by clients, forced to have abortions, um, all that sort of thing. And obviously, sexual violence more generally was a big problem. It's, it's not something I'm going to go into great detail today. Um, but I think, broadly speaking, again, it's something that where there are more similarities to us than we might like to think, because they were very opposed to any sort of sexual violence. There were law codes against it. It could, in theory, be heavily punished. But there are a lot of the same problems that we seem to see today, underreporting of such crimes, difficulties of getting a conviction, and the same tendency to sort of victim blame. So I think that was, yeah, from, for me, that was one of the most depressing sections of the book to write because uh, of those that sense that very little had changed. But let's end on a less depressing note because I want to talk a little bit about the role of um, sex in medieval culture and particularly in literature and in ours. Because as anyone who's read the Canterbury Tales or the Decameron knows, um, there are lots of bawdy tales in medieval literature. Um, you know, lots of lecherous clerics, stupid husbands, sex-mad women. 
genitals who feature standalone characters and run around having adventures, as you do. Um, some really ridiculous euphemism, euphemisms for sex, things about sort of hammering things and squirrels eating nuts and, and all sorts of bizarre things that you won't worry about the mind that came up with them. Um, and there are also some sort of really bizarrely explicit verses that discuss sexual organs in graphic detail. I'm about to mangle a couple of Welsh names. Um, Daphne Fat Griffith Williams, The Penis, which was written in 14th century Wales, it is a poem that's both a complaint about that organ's unruly nature, it's difficult to keep you under control, and a boast of sexual prowess. You were longer than a big man's thigh, to pick a couple of choice quotes. Um, and then there's a, there's a few few years later, there, there's a poem by a woman called Gwerthel and Mecken, The Female Genitals, which is a sort of female counterpoint to this poem. I mean, it lacks the personal boasting, but it's equally explicit. And I think it's very hard at this sort of distance of time to work out what people were doing with that sort of thing. Are they, are they trying to shock? I think quite possibly. There's a whole debate about whether pornography in the sense that we now um, define it existed in the Middle Ages and the consensus is that it probably didn't. Um, but clearly people were writing about sort of, yeah, very explicit things in a way that I think contrasts quite sharply with this idea of medieval society as very buttoned up uh, and very obsessed with sin. And of course, medieval art is a, is a particularly um, good illustration of this. And so, um, yeah, I thought I'd finish up by showing you a small selection of images. And I expect a lot of you have seen this one in the, in the flesh. This is the Sheila McGeek at um, Kilpeck. And these images of um, basically, basically female expressionists showing off their genitals are in lots of churches in the British Isles, in France and in Spain. And nobody really knows why. Um, you know, some people have suggested they're sort of pagan survivals, but I the fact that they're on churches and very much on buildings controlled by the church, I, I don't think that works. They may have been seen to have sort of protective functions, so that's something like that was supposed to scare the devil off. Some people have suggested they've got pedagogical functions, that they're actually some sort of symbol of the um, perils of childbirth, and so they're actually warnings against lust. Um, but nobody really knows. Um, and similarly, sort of male exhibitionists in churches. This is one from above the um, monks' choir at Norwich Cathedral. Um, and I think that probably quite clearly is a warning against drunkenness. But why you need to show off your genitals to warn people against dr drunkenness is, is is an interesting question. Um, and certainly to us, I mean, to, to us, I think to put these sorts of things in churches feels deeply inappropriate. So that there is a, a real question about the sort of the, yeah the gulf between our ideas and theirs there. So. And it's not just churches, that there are medieval manuscripts decorated with such delights as these nuns and their penis trees. And this is a medieval copy of the, the Romance of the Rose and bears no relation to the story in the text. And again, there's a, there's a big debate amongst art historians about what this is all about. And again, nobody's really got to the bottom of it. Um, and then personal objects, things like this seal, this is the seal of a chap called Jean Grunard, um, showing his nickname, Bocatou. I'll let you translate that. Um, three phalluses. And again, I mean, it's very hard to know what to make of this because this is the only, certainly the only one I've come across that's like this. And so is this one chap who's really out there and trying to shock people? Is this something that he had his personal use, but he had a proper one for, um, shall we say, more business-like letters? What did, what did recipients think of this? We don't know. Um, that might, may have been just one odd chap. These ones, there are far more of these, badges of genitalia. Um, and they're particularly from the Netherlands, where there have been a few examples come out of the Thames. And there are enough of these to size. So this, this isn't sort of one odd person. This, this is something that was briefly quite popular. Um, and again, it, it's hard to know, hard to read them back. I think it's hard, hard to understand exactly why you would wear one of those and we don't know did people wear them openly did they wear under their clothes were they good luck charms we, we honestly don't really know so to sort of to go back to where i started I, I suppose one of the things that you know out of this book for me have come both a lot of similarities and a lot of differences and obviously there are a lot of things we have in common both in terms of attitudes and experiences and a lot of differences, and I think probably something like this illustrates better than anything the, the gulf between medieval and modern attitudes to sex in a way that is quite striking. And I'm going to use my headset. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, it's all good. It was uh, full of uh, fascinating insights. I, I think we can safely say that you have um, shown that sex did not begin in the 1960s. <laughs> Are there, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Don't be shy. I've shocked everybody <laughs> into silence. <laughs> Oh, okay, Emma. Hey, thank you. That was excellent. Um, I've been thinking. Uh, well, I was just thinking. You know, the um, this a modern scholar drew up all the days in which you're not allowed to have sex, and mm -hmm. it worked out to be, um, like one afternoon a year kind of thing, but it was okay. Yeah, yeah. That's contra That that's that's according to church teachings and prohibitions. But that's contradictory within the church to it, the church's idea that you owe yourself with conjugal debts and all of that. Did mm -hmm. You know, was it is is there that tension, and was it ever sort of regulated that you can't have sex on these days, and, and the extent to which it is, you know, the procreate, yeah, all the different tensions in there kind of make it. Yeah, no, and I think there are always lots of tensions, and they're obviously trying to generalize about the church. It, yeah. It's such a hard thing to do because there are obviously some hardliners who basically think nobody should ever have sex, and some people who seem far more relaxed about things. But I did, there does seem to be this big shift around 1200 um, from the sort of the very hard line early medieval, no, you must not have sex in Lent and it will be punished quite harshly um, to, you know, it's it's a necessary evil sometimes. I'm not sure they never get past it's a necessary evil, but but th there does seem to be this shift that they do become, the church does in theory become more accepting in a way that I think is quite interesting. And some, I mean, some of these problems that they're theorising about I've, I've been writing something recently about sort of pollution of churches, and they and they worry about things like what 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 do they do if, if somebody's had sex on the roof? And you think that this was this real problem they dealt with? <laughs> um, but yeah, no, there's, a, there's a quite a, quite a range, and definitely always some contradictions there. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't there a great um, problem of privacy, privacy in those mm. days? Because most people's houses were rather small, and so many people living in them. That's why there's a connotation undertone to Shakespeare's jolly, sweet lovers love the spring. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, were, 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 um, were people in authority stumbling upon couples in for granting the woods and the fields mansion, then finding them for. Mm. No, I, th I think that whole question of privacy is really interesting. I've, I've been doing, the, the, the book's just come out in Spanish, and I've been doing interviews this week with people in Spain who have kept asking about sex education in the Middle Ages. And I have said several times, yeah, I think, you know, obviously there were sort of advice manuals and things, and mothers are supposed to teach their children. But it, one of the realities must have been that a lot of people were living in very confined spaces and had seen people and animals having sex sort of from quite a young age. You do definitely get cases, certainly fornication cases, where somebody goes, well, we saw them having sex in the barn or, yeah, in the fields or whatever. You, I do have occasionally come across sexual assault cases where a witness says, I saw this through a hole in the wall. Um, so, yeah, I think probably there was far less privacy than, than we would expect. There's a, whole, there's a whole debate, actually, about how much that impacts on whether nudity was seen as erotic or not and whether the increase in privacy, at least for elites in the 15th century, that my, nudity became more erotic at that point. And, yeah. But no, I think a, re a really important angle. Yeah, thank you. Uh, although, uh, of course, th thinking about um, the my, my talk uh, la later this afternoon about the spurs, uh, we of course had the uh, recent example of the current spare, uh, <laughs> the news coming out about his uh, frolics in a field. In uh, in 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 this case, uh, not observed, but uh, the the lady in question uh, now telling the newspapers. Uh, any any more questions, Stephen? I think it's in fourteen twenty eight. There's a report from the Privy Council, which describes Catherine de Valois at that time as a widow as. Mm -hmm a licentious and libidinous young woman. Mm -hmm. How much would that reflect individual concerns or how much would it reflect 
male attempts to control individual women sexuality mm. political sexuality yeah no i mean i think one of the things actually one of the differences i haven't talked about but one of the things that is probably i think quite surprising to a lot of people about medieval ideas about sexuality is that they very much saw women as the last of sex um and yeah obviously that is very easy to turn on women in as in her case and uh, some, somewhere else you see it sometimes is in rape cases where some people some men have got this theory that well, well a woman can only you know if, if a woman conceives it's not really rape and that and that yeah I mean, obviously this is still, still people saying that today american politicians for example <laughs> um but yeah so again more depressing continuities but no that it is, that it is something that very much can be turned back on women and very much to their disadvantage which i think is a, is a really important point yeah <laughs> just going back to the question of privacy i'm afraid i can't cite you any sources but in gloucestershire there used to be a tradition of what was called bundling and that was because certainly among peasant families producing children to carry on with the work of the farm was extremely important and apparently a young couple would be wrapped up together in a room and left to get on with it and if the woman then became pregnant, uh, the, they would go ahead and get married. Nothing happened. The couple would just go their ways. Mm. No, I mean, I think this whole question of sort of premarital sex is a, is a very interesting one. And I think certainly people have done work on the 16th century parish registers, haven't they, where they, I think the rates of bridal pregnancy are estimated at something like 25, 30%. So clearly there was a, quite a lot of premarital sex. I have come across one case, I think it's Yorkshire, but I wouldn't swear to that where a couple end up in court for um for premarital sex and somebody says that he actually said that he wa he wanted to have sex with her before they got married to see if she was fertile so yeah and again we get in a circuit in a situation world in which it's very different to, difficult to split up if, if it goes wrong you can see why people would have wanted to just make sure things were going to work yeah but today there's a tremendous hype about gender dysphoria was there any consciousness of gender dysphoria then? Hmm. I, d I don't think they saw it in quite the way that we do. Certainly there are cases, uh, there's quite a lot about cross-dressing, which is something they're quite concerned about. Um, and there are, I've got, I have got a few cases in the book of people who do seem to have lived as the opposite gender. Um, there's a particularly famous English case, John Eleanor Rickner, who's, who's arrested for soliciting in London in the very late 14th century who quite clearly sometimes seems to have lived as John, sometimes as Eleanor, and sold sex in both personas. Um, there's a case in Venice a few decades earlier um, of, a, of a person who I think is probably intersex from the description in, in the court records and who'd been sort of brought up as, as a boy and later identifies as a woman. And again, it's a prostitution case, sells so, so sex as a woman in, in Venice. Um, and again, I suppose the other cases that do come in these is, is some of these cases of, of women having sex with other women and some of these women not only sort of take the male role in sex but do cross-dress, do seem to live as men and some of the women they have sex with actually claim that they thought this was a man. Now, of course, there are re reasons why they might do that in terms of trying to get a lesser punishment. But uh, yeah, I think we can see some sort of sense that there have always been people people who've had complicated gender identities and not necessarily identified with how they were born, if you put it that way. I was going to follow on. So, yeah, there's um, uh, certainly in intersex is, is acknowledged because um, mm. Justinian's law code refers to it. How, how do you, in the laws, how do you deal with someone who's got characteristics of both? I think classical statues show depict intersex. And then, yeah, I think in the case of Eleanor John Rickener, he doesn't, he is a sex worker as a woman but otherwise as himself or something has sex with women but he's pimped out as a female prostitute to, to clergy and all sorts of mm. things like that's really interesting case because there's no record of any kind of prosecution or anything it's just a narrative in the the mayoral court role or whatever it's not even it doesn't have any any a, um prosecution or anything with it just yeah. Yeah. No, it's a really interesting one. I, th I think it was Jeremy Goldberg, wasn't it, who wrote a paper about such a sit night. It all been Ruth a fiction. Ruth Karras did as well, I think. That yeah. satire on Richard II. I think, yeah, the Karras yeah. one was definitely the first one, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 